I'm Emily. And I'm Hannah. We are best friends and dietitians. We have a goal of challenging nutrition misinformation and fitness trends with an evidence-based approach. Each episode, we will dish up our thoughts about the latest facts on a popular health-related topic. We're the Upbeat Dietitians. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to a brand new episode of the Upbeat Dietitians podcast. In today's episode, we are joined by Elias. Elias is from LA. And with the help of his wrestling coach and physical therapist, Elias opened up his fitness and coaching business when he was 15 years old. Now, almost 10 years later, he continues to share his passion of self-improvement through the vehicle of fitness and mindset with clients all over the U.S. and internationally. Elias graduated from Purdue University, boiler up, with a BS of health and kinesiology and was the lead personal trainer overseeing over 50 trainers at the university's recreation center. He now is able to dedicate more time to his online coaching clients and is getting his master's of science degree of exercise science with a concentration in strength and conditioning at the University of South Florida. Elias aims to own his own warehouse gym and continue to develop his brand training more athletes and providing evidence-based scientifically supported training methods. Aside from fitness, Elias loves going to music festivals and cooking slash going out for wild cuisine and cocktails. Enjoy the episode. Elias, welcome to the podcast today. Thank you for having me. We are so happy to have you here. So today we are going to, well, I guess first things first, we've got a fitness pro on board once again. So we're of course going to go into the fitness side of things. We love, love, love talking with our trainer friends because Emily and I dabble in it, but we don't often get too, too much into it. So we're very excited to go into that. We're actually going to go into today. Um, the big differences between like muscle hypertrophy versus muscular strength and kind of how those two work together, but also work separately. Um, but first things first, we always have our guests kind of take us through like a day in the life, what you do for work, education, boiler up, hobbies, education, <laughs> all that good stuff. So take it away. Absolutely. Gosh. So I'll give you the the Elias fitness journey from the beginning. Um, I was never, I was never a athletic kid growing up. I was the goofy theater kid. Uh, I was in the LA children's choir. I was in theater all my life in high school. It wasn't until like, I tried sports when I was younger. Um, but I was never really into it. And finally I joined a wrestling team when I was like in like sixth grade, I was like about 11 years old and finally found something I clicked with um very very quickly became very competitive and then by my freshman year of high school I was on the varsity team and then by my sophomore year um so that's like 15 16 years old um I had a friend John who was like Elias I know you're really into fitness I want to be on the baseball team but I have a, a lot of weight to lose it seems like I'm I, I'm not feeling like in my body and I'm working with doctors and I don't know really what to do can you help me and I said I I guess I'd never really thought about working with someone before but you know we can we can, I had no certifications I didn't know what to do formally but I was doing a lot of things for myself and uh working with physical therapists and had my wrestling coach and a track coach at the time so I said hey let's um I'll kind of design something like an outline. Let's meet once a week and I'll just basically be like your fitness advisor. And it slowly became that I was like his unofficial trainer. We would just meet and I'd do uh, like once a week. And it, I, so much more than the physical part, I started to really, really love the emotional and psychological aspect of training and also helping people. I know Hannah and Emily, you can relate to that. Just working with a patient, working with a client and feeling that you are giving them value and, and giving them tools for themselves to improve, to take on, even after, you know, you're long gone and, and they're not, we're not working with them. You have tools to, that they can use for themselves. So that really uh, kind of flipped a switch in my head and he ended up being on the baseball team and having this huge fitness transformation. Now this, that was almost 10 years ago. Um, I was 15 then I'm turning 25 in, a, in like about two months. So yeah, that was, now he's a power lifter and way stronger than I am. And it's, it's really incredible to see this, that transformation. So yeah, that's kind of where like the seed was planted. So then 
uh, kept doing sports through high school. Um, and then I actually suffered a stress fracture in my lower, uh, my L4 vertebrae um, from wrestling. And that kind of turned me on as more to the rehab and what I like to call as prehab, which is like training um, side of things and st actually studying the body and kinesiology and nutrition and things like that. So formally created like my little business, Elias, Elias the trainer as like a, like as a high school student, um, kind of with the supervision of my wrestling coach and some physical therapists. So I did have some guidance um, and I would train, train st other students, you know, in high school. And, and that sort of blossomed into going originally. So I, um, Hannah, you and I met at Purdue, but I originally started college um, at San Francisco State because I'm from Southern California. So I went to uh, San Francisco State as a film major, not even, not even, uh, not even kinesiology because I still was like the actor and writer and I want to do things. And I worked at a private gym there, uh, the Village Fitness Center. And I was surrounded by uh, nutritional science majors and exercise science, kinesiology and master students. And I realized that this is something I really wanted to do. So I changed majors and I eventually ended up transferring to Purdue. And that's where I started the whole kinesiology and then was a trainer there and then quickly became lead trainer. And then one thing led to another and it just blew up. So that was basically, I almost feel like I didn't find fitness. Fitness kind of found me and um, that's the kind of, yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing how like one thing can lead to another and it just, just felt right. And I'm sure you guys can relate to this. Like, I, I love what I do. So it doesn't feel like work a lot of the time. Like sometimes obviously like, it's like, okay, like I need to take a break. I need a cocktail. Like I need to relax a little bit, but, um, yeah, that's kind of the, uh, that's kind of the origin story of how I got into things. I think I, I think I answered your question. Um, you did, you did. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I guess my only leading or not yes. leading question, but question after that is what are you currently doing for work? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I still, in one way or another, this brand or this training business that I created 10 years ago has evolved and changed, but it still exists. And what it is now is um, asynchronous, um, fitness coaching where I design, I have a couple of different packages. Some are more hands-on than others. Um, but it's basically, I have, I have clients all over the country. Um, and I actually had a few in a couple other countries like India and, uh, different parts of Europe for a little while, but basically design a workout plan. Um, it's very communication based, so it's very personable and I'm a very talkative person, engaging person. So I love that. Um, and basically, yeah, I design a program. They go and do it on their own time, but they're sending me videos. We, I send back the videos with like lines drawn and things. And we talk about form. We talk about adherence. Obviously, I'm not a dietitian. I understand my separation with uh, food and exercise, but I still provide um, like basic scientific, um, like physiological processes. Um, I'm currently, so I finished my bachelor's in health and kinesiology at Purdue. And then now I'm currently in uh, getting my master's of exercise science and strength and conditioning at University of South Florida in Tampa. Funny thing about uh, USF is it's called USF University of South Florida, but it's not in South Florida. It's in Tampa, which is like me medium Florida, mid Florida. And it's just called that because at the time when the university was created, it, that was just the most Southern Florida university so I just think that's hilarious. And it's really weird because everyone's like, oh, you're in South Florida, Miami, like have a good time. I'm like, yeah, like I could drive three, four hours. Like it's not quite, but Tampa is super awesome. Uh, the bucks are there. Um, so that's lots of fun things going on, but yeah. So currently for work doing this asynchronous training, networking with some um, other professionals, such as yourselves, um, things like that. And then doing school, which takes up a lot of my it's 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 a lot less physical time in person than like undergrad but i basically like i basically create a work week for myself with uh you know writing papers and things my program is very research driven so now I, it was a little more traditional like lectures in the beginning of the, my first year but at this point a lot of my professors are like okay we're gonna throw up 
a bunch of meta-analyses and systematic reviews and just go through this research so you can have these conversations with people and just be like, this is not just like, because then there's the whole camp. You probably have people, are you like, I'm not a textbook. I'm not a, I'm not a this, like I'm my own person. Like, yes, absolutely. So there's the textbook academia. And then there's all the people that, you know, want to do things a certain way. But then in the happy medium, you have research studies and not just one, several like on top of each other that can reveal these different things about people. So um, yeah, that's kind of what I'm doing right now. Heavily invested in uh, research that is exercise uh, based heavily. And then I do get a bit of um, sports nutrition specifically for uh, by uh, Dr. Bill Campbell. If you've heard of him, he's uh, huge in, uh, uh, in uh, exercise science and sports nutrition. He's a really, really, really funny guy. And he has a really awesome Instagram presence. He he's really does a great job of kind of breaking things down and delivering them in a really digestible way, no pun intended. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so that's that's kind of what I'm what I'm doing now. We love some good digestive tract humor. That's great. <laughs> it's really great. Yeah. Um, I love to hear how you and your clients, even though you're like virtual, you like send yeah. videos back and forth. That's so cool. Yeah. I have never heard of that before. I mean, I've heard of like videos back and forth, not like drawing yeah. lines, like mechanics and all that. That's super yeah. neat. Yeah. So that idea I got from, it was, it was a class in, I don't know what the software was called, but it was at Purdue in the biomechanics class. We, there was a software you could go through a video frame by frame and track the joints and see how these were moving and so that just gave me a very basic idea of literally on your iphone or for non-iphone users non-iphone users i call green people because when you text them they have green messages um, <laughs> um uh, and my one of my best friends jordan hates it when i call him that um, but he is a green person so i'm green gonna person. call him a green person um yeah when you take photos and videos you can also create lines mm -hmm. and so usually what I'll do is I'll have like and, and this even comes down to the basics of like psychology and like I won't use generally I won't use the color red because red is like oh bad like incorrect I'll just use like green and blue both kind of positive colors and be like here this is where we are this is green or this is blue and I'll kind of even switch them around so there's like oh I'm receiving green and kind of psychology like psychology programming them to see green um but saying, yeah, this is where we are right now. And I'll draw some lines. Maybe their wrists are like this. People are like, kind of like squatting like this. Like, this is where the green is. This is where we want with the blue, you know? So kind of, um, it's, it's so, nothing beats in-person training or like you guys have like an in-person, uh, even like when you're doing, I imagine with a, with a patient, just speaking to them in person, you're able, you just, it comes off differently. So being able to, provide something a little more specific because I can't palpate and be like pointing or like showing them like that. So yeah, just like things like that and constant communication. So I have like a basic service that's like, okay, here's a program. We'll meet once a week. This is kind of your own thing that you're doing. Then I have an all service program that I basically tell them like, please bother me. If it's two in the morning and I'm programming and I'm awake, like I have boundaries for myself. Obviously you guys know, like you can't let your patients and clients take over your life because you're just don't, you're not a robot, you know, you need to have life. Um, but I said, if it is within my, the strength of my being to answer you, I will answer you. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's really fun. It's really dynamic. It allows me to still be in school and travel right now. I'm, I'm going to a music festival next weekend in Washington and it's a camping festival. So I will not have access to, my phone or the internet for several days. So I'm sending in my, in my newsletter, I send every week, I said, Hey guys, I'll be gone. I'm sending everyone's uh, programs for next week ahead of time. And it allows me to do that. So it's very, it's very flexible and fun. Uh, it's very, and it's just engaging. It's fun to talk to people and be like, Hey, how's it going? What's how, how can I help you today? It's, it's, it's awesome. It's also it's so awesome. cool that you could see people from like different countries and yeah. around the u.s that you're yeah. not limited by location so that's awesome mm -hmm. absolutely like and, and that's the, the the thing with my program it's not like oh you better have this kind of equipment you better have this kind of stuff i actually most of the when i really started this formally how i do things about three years ago was in three two and a half was in 
like the height of COVID. So all we had or all most people had was textbooks and backpacks and things like this. So how it works for me is like whatever you have access to will make it work. Some people, even now, some people now are still locked away in COVID. Some people are free balling it, especially in Florida where I'm at. Um, so there's a very big spectrum of availability, comfortability, um, and, and, and what someone's, you know, just, yeah, comfortable doing. So being able to be like, oh yeah, like you are not limited by what you are physically limited to be like, yeah, we can make anything work. It's, it's been, again, just really dynamic and, and, and organic. It's been cool. Yeah. That's a sign of a good like trainer, practitioner, whatever is mm -hmm. meeting the client, wherever they're at, whatever they've got access to not pushing them beyond their means, if that's not going to be helpful for them. hundred percent. 100%. Exactly. Well, it's actually a really great segue into our first mm -hmm. question on the topic today. So we've touched on this before, I think a little bit, Emily and I have, but before we kind of get into the nitty gritty about hypertrophy, strength, all that fun mm -hmm. stuff, tell us about some of the benefits of strength, or I guess more broadly, resistance training in general. Yeah, definitely. So gosh, where do I start? Well, <laughs> my, 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 my science nerdy gears are starting to turn. Um, uh, let's see, we can start with just on a basic, like protection level, having more skeletal muscle. I mean, there are, as you guys know, there's more than one kinds of muscle. You have cardiac and smooth, which is cardiac, your heart smooth, you know, all around your organs and your, uh, 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 venous system. Um, but specifically if we're talking in general, probably most people, when they hear muscle, they think of skeletal muscle that can act to protect your body. Generally, when you have more skeletal muscle on your frame, when you are physically hit by something or run into something, usually that will protect your body, um, increasing, you know, things like bone density, sensitivity to calcium. Um, a lot of it's, it's so interesting. Yes, of course, protein is really, really, really important. And it's most people would benefit by adding more protein in their diet, as you guys way, know way more than I do at this point. Um, but things also like calcium, calcium is essential for, uh, muscle twitch. And, you know, if you don't have calcium in your muscle cells, you don't have muscle contraction. Um, so, you know, making sure to have, be consuming, uh, sufficient calcium from whatever sources are, are, uh, digestible and comfortable for your body. Um, let's think then there's, that's as we start to partition, um, which is a word I use when I talk about strength and hypertrophy, especially with my professor, uh, Dr. Samuel Buckner, who is one, it seems to be one of the leading researchers on this partition because for years and years and years, everyone talked about it as like one marriage, married thing. Um, and I'll, I won't digress until we get to that question in a second, but um, yeah. So when you have strength, like what is strength of physical capability of lifting a heavier load and then hypertrophy, that's simply the increase of mus muscle cell size. Some people think like, oh, I'm getting more muscle cells. That would be uh, hyperplasia. And it's seen for the most part. And I want to use this language throughout our whole conversation. And this is basically the language that I've adopted, especially in my master's, master's program is not ever speaking for the most part, unless there's a physiological process that we just seem to understand. And like, this is how it works to have like basically assessments on things like this seems to be what we understand about this topic now, but there is room to, for me to be wrong. You know, like I'm not saying that muscle size and strength do not exist together at all. You know, it just seems to be with the research that we have that there is a difference and they're, they're not interacting as synergistically as we thought. Um, so I digress though, um, um, to kind of to circle it back benefits of resistor training more than kind of how we think about athletics and, you know, being strong and bench pressing a thousand pounds and all the, all that, all that fun, crazy stuff, just bringing it back to its root. That's, that makes grandma and grandpa being able to walk around the block with you guys and, you know, go to, go to little Sammy's 
softball game longer and you know being just functionality i can ask you know i don't have to ask someone to reach something off the top shelf just general functionality and i was actually on a walk with my with my mom the other day and i thought i was like isn't it funny or it's honestly in a weird way because i've we've basically structured i think all three of us our lives around uh health fitness and wellness isn't it funny that we now have to create something a time in our day to do these things like that didn't have to happen before like we have to go out of our way to eat a certain way or 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 think about that a certain way or like i'm going to go exercise now because it's good for me we didn't have to do that in less than a thousand years ago that was way more part of our lifestyle and we just got those nutrients and got that exercise just by living. And now, you know, as our brains have evolved and our lifestyles have changed, we have to go out of our way to do that. So it's really, it's very, it's a, it's a weird paradox because we are evolving in some ways, but then we've got to do simple things. Like I'm going to go into a room with air conditioning and pick up this weight or walk on this treadmill or, you know, do this stretch. It's, it's, it's bizarre, but it's yeah. It's just I have never ever. thought of that before. That is so funny and like <laughs> scarily true how funny it is, but like it applies so much to like nutrition too. We have to like, like our job did not exist a thousand years ago because people right. weren't struggling to like get the right <laughs> nutrients or yeah. like meet whatever goals they have. But now we are always going to have a job because <laughs> there's always people like yeah. wanting to improve certain things. And it's really difficult because we live lives where it's not just like happening where we're like mm -hmm. meeting our fitness and nutrition goals. Right. And probably something, probably something you guys deal with as much, or even if not more than I do is you didn't, you didn't have the internet, even you didn't have the internet probably a hundred, a hundred years ago, less than, less than that. You didn't have people spreading information on this diet or this diet or this diet or that, you know, I'm saying the D word, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> That's okay. Um, we'll, I'm doing, I'm doing, I'm we're going to bleep it out. <laughs> <laughs> um, I did that on purpose though, but you know, and so kind of what I've talked about becoming with fitness, you guys are doing the exact same with nutrition is I like to call myself a, a, um, like a, like a health and fitness BS demon slayer, like <laughs> cutting, cutting through the weeds and fighting the good fight of, you know, you're not advocating for a certain, a, it has to be this way. It's just making educated decisions for yourself based on science, based on seemingly true things. I, I want to use the word prove, usually the word prove, you're probably more aware of this as well. Um, not, most things aren't necessarily proven more just unproven proven is like, cause they, not saying proven leaves room for improvement. Um, so, um, I just lost my train of thought. The hamster wheels are, are turning. I get excited. I get really, I love talking about this. I'm, I'm so excited. That's okay. Be, be Honestly, here. it's um, the best when our guests <laughs> like really love their stuff. So this is like making yeah. my day. I love this. Yeah. Well, let's get into the nitty gritty then, since we yeah. are on such a, a roll, yeah. um, which also, by the way, I also love the demon slayer thing. That's really great. Yeah. He's stealing that. I'm totally yeah. stealing that. Please, please. Um, okay. We touched on that a little bit, but what is hypertrophy training? What is strength training? How do they differ and how are they similar? Because mm -hmm. you kind of mentioned how they might have some things in common. So I guess mm -hmm. what are the big ways that they differ and are similar? Yeah, perfect. So I guess on a very, very basic level, you have the traditional like, oh, one to five reps for strength and six to 12 to maybe 15 for hypertrophy and then like 12 to 15 plus for endurance. And there's some, if not a lot of truth to those rep ranges, if intensity, which is a huge, huge thing. It's not like I can just pick up my phone and I'm going to do five reps and now my arm is stronger. And if I had done one more, I would have gotten bigger, but no, I did five, not six. So I'm going to be strong, not, not, not bigger. And same thing with endurance. So those spectrums match kind of, if you're um, the same, how, the three energy systems work. You have oxidative phosphorylation, 
you have glycolysis, which kind of branches into fast and slow. And then you have uh, creatine phosphate or ATP. I've heard 10 million ways to call that one. Um, but basically, you know, creatine, using creatine for quick energy. You're never using those energy systems independently. They're all working at the same time. Excuse me. They're all working at the same time. It's just one is always in predominance. One is always taking the brunt of the energy your body is producing. Same thing with these rep ranges or same, same thing with these adaptions. You're never just getting stronger, just getting bigger, or just increasing your endurance one at a time. Usually, for the most part, if you're training, all three are happening. You're just funneling more focus into one at a time. So if intensity is high enough, and that's a big thing for people is often they're not training as intensely as they should be. Now, that's not to say take every set to failure, no days off, 10,000 grams of protein. I'm a, I'm a robot. But usually, if you have like a basic RPE scale of zero to 10 or one to 10, training somewhere in the range of six to 10, and generally not even going to 10 all the time. Now that that's very general. I'm speaking very generally and that slightly differs. The more advanced you get, sometimes you do need a higher stimulus to adapt because I like to think of fitness or health or wellness in general, like a funnel, you know, in the beginning, you know, you can sneeze and you'll get stronger, you know, like it's, it do just doing anything will, 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 uh, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? Will adaption will occur. And then over time, you have to get more and more specific. Intensity will go up, volume will go up, maybe exercise selection will differ, um, but not too much because honestly, doing the basics is what's going to get you doing. It's not like, you know, professional bodybuilders and powerlifters aren't doing, you know, one handed clean snatches with uh, negative gravity and all that kind of stuff. Like it's, that kind of stuff are people on the internet just trying to make money from you that are trying to trick you because they're like, oh, look at my circus trick. It's gonna just they're just selling something. Bring me back if I've if I've if I've ranted. I have a habit of doing that. No, this is um, good. This is good. Yeah. So yeah. I guess that said, that said, that's a good segue too. Um, you're like making your own segue, which I just love. Yeah. <laughs> so that said, who are the type of people who should be training for hypertrophy and who should be training more for strength? Like how can how can our listeners know like what one yeah. they should be like focusing on if they even should be focusing on one specifically? Right. Right. So that's actually, I love this question when I saw in the notes before, because I wrote my final, I wrote two final papers for my strength and conditioning class that just ended uh, last month. And one of the papers was on, I love my, my professor, Dr. Samuel Buckner is awesome because in all of his papers, he creates real world prompts. Not like, not like, tell me the difference of uh, size and strength. It was, you are the head strength and conditioning coach for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers uh, football team. What does your plan look like and justify where size and strength and the partition of those two things exists. So very real world application. So what uh, we'll, I'll just reiterate, what is muscle hypertrophy? Muscle gets bigger. That's all that happens. What is muscle strength? I can move more weight. Now we come to athletics and we have this classic idea that bigger and badder is, and stronger is better. But what, what about sitting on your back, lifting a, a stick across your chest is going to help you sprint across a field carrying an egg-shaped item and run and pivot and move in such a dynamic 3d plane it's it's different so yeah like even in, when i and i played a little bit of football in high school and and i had an amazing coach but it was a little more old school it's like you have to bench press 200 pounds to be on varsity like where does that really come from yes overall strength is important but I think it's way, way, way more prioritized than it should be in athletics. Now, to, to, diff, to kind of segue from that, a strength, a strength uh, sport like strongman or powerlifting, where the literal 
uh, object of the sport is to be as strong as possible. That is its own camp. I'm speaking for, you know, tra- I don't want to say traditional sports, but more when we like football, basketball, baseball, softball, um, you know, wrestling, any, any of the th- more classic you know, gymnastics, even my professor, Dr. Buckner was uh, a gymnast uh, and he would talk about the difference. And so where does strength training and hypertrophy, where does that sit in an athlete's program? Maybe we create some baseline strength so the, that musculature is starting to get strong. But then we have the idea of three-dimensional movement, something like another paper I wrote was on gymnastics. So what does, again, what does your bench press or your squat, or your deadlift have to do with you doing an iron horse or you know sprinting down a trampoline and flipping around or being on the double bars? Like it can, We can use maybe strength to create baseline create other exercises that are 3d maybe we do like i have a client who's on the ucsb uh, golf team and we do weightlifting but in a very power focused way dynamically so we do a, a lot of landmine stuff so he's changing so we're doing like a he'll do like a row and then twist and into a press and that's that's his golf swing right there so we're choosing things it's kind of the, the law of specificity, basically. You're not going to, you know, just just be like, you're not going to take a random power lifter, put them in a basketball game. You're like, oh, this is an amazing athlete. He's going to be amazing at basketball too, you know? There's an incredible in, a priority for specificity. So yeah, basically kind of to everyone listening, kind of rewiring how you're thinking about athletics, being as specific as possible is essential. It's not even me suggesting it's, it's very essential to your success in what you're doing. So where does hypertrophy meet that? Does being big help you in your sport? Let's take uh, wrestling. For example, I was a wrestler all of my life. Every ounce on your body matters because weight classes matter. And so just getting big for the sake of getting big does not really increase your performance. And this can segue later when we talk about the difference of size and strength, but do I want to increase my flexibility, increase my strength, increase my endurance for my performance of my sport? Or do I want to look like Mr. Olympia? What, what would that serve me? What are your priorities? So for an athlete, for the most part, I don't think hypertrophy really is important. Uh, I made a case just to play devil's advocate to my own argument. I made a case like maybe for linemen on a, in a football team, it could help because the bigger and heavier they are, the more they're, you know, they're not running, moving as much. There could be an argument there. But then again, maybe we still focus on strength. So their performance is still high, even though they're not, maybe not as physically large, they still have the strength to overpower their opponent, just like in wrestling, same thing. Um, And then on the flip side, where does hypertrophy matter more than anything? That would be the sport of bodybuilding, which um, we actually work with a lot of, uh, of bodybuilders there's actually some professional bodybuilders in my class i have a few ifbb pros um that are in my class which are really fun and then the gym i go to i train at a uh, fam uh in tampa is run by um anastasia writer who's uh uh a, a, a not not a professional but she's very high competing bodybuilder and then her husband um derek oslan who's an ifbb pro he placed eighth in the Olympia and the 212 division last year. Awesome people. Um, if you're ever in Tampa, please go train there. It's they're super emotionally intelligent and just awesome to be around. Um, but yeah, I digress kind of. So where, where, yeah. So just thinking how specific, like, what, what do you want? You have to make a decision. You don't have to choose. You don't have to, you don't, uh, let me back up. You don't have to choose one or the other outright. If you just want to be a lifestyle person, you know, I want to be healthy. I want to be strong. I want to be big. Like I, I have a lot of clients on a power building program. They increase their main list, but they also get bigger. Like, but if you want to go a little bit more in the competitive route or start to, cause it like, like I said, 
training and nutrition to some extent is a funnel. We have to get more specific the more we want to go to our, to our, towards our goal. So um, kind of just understanding what your goal is and prioritizing that. But then there's also the argument of like, you know, I just want to be healthy metabolically. I want to look good. I want to be strong. You can't have a program that has both, but it's just, if you want to take either one in a certain direction, you then start to get more specific. Totally. We actually had another trainer on a few episodes ago, Steve Washuda, and he said very similar stuff. It was like the, the topic of the episode was like, should we train for vanity or train for health? And we kind of summed it up as like training for health is likely it's going to keep you going till you're 60, 70, 80 years old. But if you have vanity goals, oftentimes it starts that way for a lot of people. And even if you do have those goals over a period of time, that's totally fine. But I think training for health is going to be for, again, speaking very general here, a really great thing as it does have all those benefits you kind of listed off in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So anyway, it sounds like you and Steve are kind of saying similar things, which is just really, yeah. really great. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I had a thought. <laughs> yes. Because I was thinking the same thing as you, Hannah. I was like, oh my gosh, this sounds exactly Steve. like <laughs> this sounds exactly like what Steve was talking about. And you also already answered our next question already. So I was gonna like segue into that. But for people who are indecisive and mm -hmm. they're like, I don't want to compete or I don't want to get really big. I just want to work out, but like, also, do I need to make different goals? Like, do I need to choose one or the other? Can they do both? Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a beautiful question because then I say, guess what, what, what's the best kind of exercise, the exercise that you enjoy. Yeah. Yeah. So then, yeah. Then, so for my lifestyle clients that they're like, yeah, I have no desire to compete or in a, in a powerlifting meet or in a bodybuilding show or anything like that. I just want to feel good, look good. Like, yeah, totally. I have, you can have a program, like generally like a basic setup is having like a top set of strength, having some back down work of hypertrophy. Will you adapt? Will you get stronger? Will you get bigger? Yeah, absolutely. And even, even it's not like we said, the kind of with the conversation of predominance power lift, it's not like power lifters are some tiny people like they still have hypertrophy adaptations it's it's just it, it, and this is kind of where the world i come from uh a little bit more leaning to performance enhancement and and competing and things is that's just further down the line a lot of people a lot of the, your average uh, joe or jane just kind of going about their life they don't have to overcomplicate things you know they, they really just, they have to start small. They have to just, what's a thing that you can adhere to? What's a program that works for you? You're going to get endurance, strength, uh, and hypertrophy to some degree from most anything that you do. Um, as long as you're not playing the, I'm going to change my workouts every single week for entertainment, because that's a huge thing. I even had I even had a client who was a personal training colleague of mine who I coached for a little while. And I was surprised because they kept wanting, like I, I wanted their input. Like I wanted everyone's input. I, I don't like to make it a thing where I'm in control. The analogy that I use for all my clients is you're the captain of your pirate ship. I'm just the parrot on your shoulder. You can ignore me. Like you're turning the wheels. Um, and they said, they were like, I love this. It was a strength program, which is very specific. Even, arguably more than hypertrophy is very specific to fatigue uh, management. So gauging strength, how much strength can we uh, provide with the least amount of volume, basically? How can we recover from it? And they wanted to do like supersets that in their top sets and all these things. Like, I just get bored. I just get bored. And that's where I, in, I invite everyone to have the conversation being like your training. I mean, hopefully you love your training, but if you're starting to get bored from your training, one, have a conversation with yourself, what your goals are and 
I like to think of it like be passionate about the pursuit, about the end goal, about the whole idea, and don't get so wrapped up in just having to do some random new thing. And there's some, I, I, I want to speak very carefully there because enjoying what you're doing and psychological fulfillment is super important. Um, I don't want to, I don't want to come off as some robot being like, you just got to work hard and, and, and show up and do the, do the shit that, you know, no one likes to do and eat asparagus every day, you know, like, um, I'm not saying that, but there is a level, it's a balance. There is some amount of discipline. There is some amount of accountability and unfortunately a amount of repetitiveness to, uh, insight adaption or adaptation, because that's what it is. Your body I like to say your, your body wants things to be easy and that's why we adapt. But if you run 10 miles on Monday, do a spin class on Tuesday, do a crazy weightlifting thing on Wednesday, you know, binge, binge eat for three days and then expect, and then literally change everything you're doing the next week and then change everything you're doing the next week and then change everything that you're doing the next week. And then you ask yourself, man, why don't I look like Arnold Schwarzenegger or a Serena Williams? Well, that's because you didn't do it. You didn't do a system. You just hurt your body. Basically. You just basically took a two by four and smacked your body over the uh, several times and, and was like, you know, this hurts not we're doing this now. You, we got to do something about it. So that yeah, applies so much to like, even what we do, Emily and I mm -hmm. specifically talk about intuitive eating a lot, as I'm, our mm -hmm. listeners know. Um, but oftentimes intuitive eating is like viewed as like just the eat when you're hungry and stop when you're full diet. Mm -hmm. And there's, of course, truth to that. But like there needs to be a strategy. There's principles in place. There's like accountability is often needed, which is what we do as dietitians, is that accountability mm -hmm. piece. So it's not just like eating whatever you want, whenever you want it. And then just like stopping when you're full, like there is yeah. so much needs to go into it. And oftentimes it's like mm -hmm. a full out strategy. And it sounds like that's just so, so similar to mm -hmm. training as well. And mm -hmm. I think any kind of health goal, there's going to be some variation of that. Like it can't just be a simple, simple like black and white piece of instruction that you have to follow. It's right. depending on the person and like even day to day, it's going to be different. So right. anyway, I totally resonate with what you said about that in terms of the strategy and how that applies to the world of nutrition as well. Right. And that's why I probably, and I've seen the, some of the posts you guys make and where I'm sure you guys get frustrated with some people coming in the comments and being like, there's no structure there. There's what is happening. Blah, blah, blah. Like they're missing the point. Like what you guys are advocating for is something that it's, it's not like you're, it's not like you guys are saying, just go ahead and eat whatever you want. As Only much cake, as you want. that's and it. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> like, that's not what you guys are saying. You guys are revealing to people that it doesn't have to be so crazy and restrictive and just like black and white. And that there, you can with the education that you both had because it's not like you two are some two random people. You took the time to get education. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like you, you took the time to make those steps to be able to have the research and the, and the education to find those paths where you can find, you know, for weight loss, if a person that is their goal, find it, you know, both of you, we all understand you need a calorie deficit to <laughs> lose weight. Like, it's not like you're saying not to do that, but right. like you guys are saying, what form of what, how can we get there? That feels the less restrictive. You are yeah. opening a can of worms, exactly. my friend. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> like, and no, like I, I don't have anything to do. We can talk about this for three hours. Like, uh, like, and that's what I think people get are just specifically speaking to, cause I, when I follow you guys and I read these comments and I'm just like, no, like, uh, just take a second to just listen to what they're saying it's not like they're saying which I, I actually have a date with my sister today and we're driving a Krispy Kreme and and it's and it, like here I am a, a fitness professional it's like oh no like like you you can do that like it exists and it's okay and you can now are we doing that every day no do, are there some days where I want to sure but it's not like I have to have you know, uh, 
Yeah, it's, I'm, I'm getting all worked <laughs> yes. up because I, I feel the fire that you guys, I, I, I resonate when I see you guys post. And I'm just like, just, just take the time. It's, it's, the imp- <laughs> it's the impatience. It's the impatience of most human beings to not take the time to actually maybe finish the whole video or read the whole, or read the whole article or listen to the whole podcast. And they're like, Oh, you said cake, cake. They said cake. They said cake. Bad dietitian. Said, you know, bad dietitian. Bad dietitian. Exactly. Like, <laughs> like you, should edu- you should educate yourself. Like, Oh, oh okay. Sorry. I, sorry. I didn't. Sorry. I did. <laughs> I don't know. Like they want you to, yeah. Facebook education. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Emily always says, and I love this critical thought. Just have some critical thought. Yeah. Yeah. Or instead of maybe instead of uh, 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 what they do, like say these rude things, which blows my mind, because then people just go to like things that have nothing to do with nutrition or fitness. And they say really rude things. But like instead of saying something mean, why don't you ask a question or like clarify? Why? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. (laughs) I don't know. Just like instead of creating a battle, create a create a an environment which you guys do but they decide to decline the invitation of a conversation <laughs> that's a good way know? to put it yeah like that was, that's but like yeah i feel like that's that's how it is it's like i want to fight i want to fight <laughs> because you hurt my feelings and my feelings are things that i don't understand and because the chiropractor told me to eat this way and you know like not to discredit <laughs> any chiropractors like i have a lot of friends who are chiropractors it's an amazing profession but there's lanes that exist, you know, the, you know, life is a highway and I want to ride it in my lane with my expertise. You know, I'm not here saying that I'm a dietitian telling you guys to eat X, Y. And every time I have a client who's like, I have a dietitian now, I'm like, yes, 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 yes. Like, yeah. So you can say, I, I share, <laughs> I share the fashion. <laughs> yeah. 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 They just like come in guns a blazing. It's insane. <laughs> Like, I'm just trying to talk about how you don't have to like worry if you eat a donut and you come in here telling yeah. me that I'm causing diabetes in the world. Like, <laughs> please stop. That's not how it works. It's terrible, man. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's a scary world out there. Yeah. <laughs> We're doomed, but that's okay. That's another podcast. Yeah. <laughs> that's part two. That's part not two. for today. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. our, do you have any final thoughts on like our, our trainers listening, our listeners listening? Um, who maybe are just like, okay, like I get all this, I have free strength. I get the differences. If they're still like, I don't really know what I should do. Do you have any final, like last minute thoughts about any of that? So I guess to speak about some physio physiology really quick, because often people are like, and I deal with this a lot with my power lifters. Um, they're like, oh, I just got, I got, got to get really big so I can also get really strong. And in the papers that I've written and in the research, like we say, um, Dr. Samuel Buckner, uh, Dr. Schoenfeld writes a lot of research on the difference between size and strength. And it's been revealed that increasing your muscle size does not guarantee your increase in muscle strength. And it's specifically, and I use that word specific on purpose because it's specific, it's the exposure to heavier loads, heavier weight that will increase that strength. Like uh, Dr. Schoenfeld did a study in 2015 and 2016, and both, uh, both basically had each a group, one uh, trained with light to moderate loads till close to failure to be in an anabolic uh, adaptation zone, basically. And the other one with heavy loads, both had comparable statistically, uh, non-statistically significantly different um, levels of hypertrophy. Both got big, but it was only the heavy load group that had significant strength increases. So, and then, so I'll, the, and I've actually proved, uh, I, I've disproven this in my own, the way I used to cheat, uh, teach my trainers, I would do workshops with um, the new hires is I used to think it was that uh, increasing muscle size was like increasing your potential for strength. It was now basically creating the, opening the door for new strength to happen. But really that doesn't seem mechanistically to be the case from the research that we have. I wanna speak very plainly and say, it could, I could be totally wrong and I'm spouting BS right now, but with the research that we have, and there's a lot of it, 
um, it doesn't seem that there is a mechanistic synergy of the two. And A does not, A does not equal B and B does not equal C. So A equals C kind of thing. So like, yeah, have, so it, it allows for powerlifters, bodybuilders, you know, any person in their sport to choose their training a little more specifically, what do their goals want to be? And if you don't, if you're getting super frustrated listening right now, but like, I'm like, I don't want to have these goals. I just want to train. I just want to have some fun. I want to do what I want to do. Perfect. Do it. It's going to make you metabolically healthy. It's going to, you know, increase your, um, oh, here's something. Wait the, from the very first question, uh, sensitivity to insulin resistance training helps with that. Um, and if you don't know what insulin does basically very briefly, everyone is insulin is like, Oh my God, if you say insulin, everyone freaks out, just brings carbs to your working muscle. That's it. Um, now we can go down the rabbit hole with like diabetes and glucagon, but basically at its core, that's what it does. Um, so just increases the sensitivity. So people that are pre-diabetic or diabetic doing something like that might help. Um, because it makes your body more efficient, um, more than having just, you know, I can lift a certain amount or I'm this X in my arms or X inches, whatever. Um, so yeah, basically take away size and strength. There is a direction, there is a path of each and specificity for both, but don't feel like you have to focus on one or the other. If you just want to be healthy, if you want to have hybrid goals, that does exist. Now that does take a turn when you get into competing because you just want to maximize your energy output for and recovery. You know, yes, maybe I can get away with being super big and being super strong for this power lot, powerlifting competition. But is that impeding on my recovery? And will increased fatigue, and which is something I want to also be very careful about because there's different arguments for different, what is, what is fatigue? My Dr. Dr. Buckner, my, my professor always talks about, he's like, what is it? When people say they're fatigued, what is that? What you just have your fatigue meter has reached a hundred. Like, what does that mean? So people um, have a conversation about that. And for me in my papers, I've created like a blanket definition of what that is. That's kind of depleted glucogen, uh, gl glucogen. That's not a word. That would be except maybe it is. And we don't know about it. Oh my gosh. Um, uh, glycogen, intramuscular, uh, triglycerides, psychological fatigue. I'm huge on psychology. If you guys haven't already realized, I love talking about how things work, not just why they work. But um, again, I digress. So if you're hearing all of this and you're overwhelmed, just think about it at its basics. Choose something that you want to do. If you want to get more serious, talk to a professional. How can they help you be a little bit more specific? If you just want to be healthy, you want to move around, you want to lift a little bit of weight, but you want to get a little bit of shape on you, you can dabble in both. It's not a big deal. Yeah, exactly. That's what we always say, because we don't work much with those who do have specific, specific goals to like bench press X amount of pounds or build as much muscle as possible. It's mostly just, yeah, I just want to like generally be healthy, yeah. improve diabetes, whatever. So I think that's a good way to sum it up. Like those of you listening who are just wondering or feeling overwhelmed maybe by like all the different like rules and like programs and all of that, you don't have to like do all that unless you have a need or a want to do that. But most of us can just lift weights and be healthy. That's great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Amazing. So Elias, thank you so much for sharing all of your wisdom and knowledge. I know a lot of people are going to enjoy this episode. I... I love this episode. I love talking about all things fitness because I love when Hannah brings on all her trainer <laughs> friends. Yeah. And I guess it's literally just like a bank of Hannah's <laughs> trainer <laughs> friends. Um, but we always like ending our episode on a not so serious note. Let's take a step away from the science. Sometimes we bring science into it, but like a very, yeah. we get to kind of construe it how we want to interpret it type Absolutely. of science um <laughs> our bonus question for today and we always mm -hmm. let our guests start so today the question is what is the best breakfast cereal oh gosh this is this is probably like the hardest scientific question i've <laughs> pon i'm pondered in my in my grad program um actually i had a lot of time to think about this and i have <laughs> three answers because what's so, a hannah <laughs> <Just> yeah <like> <laughs> 
<laughs> if we have to go like like children's breakfast cereal which you know what i'm gonna rephrase that just fun breakfast cereal because I, I, i'm not a child <laughs> i'd like to eat this i love i do love cinnamon toast crunch cinnamon toast crunch is really 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 good if we want to get a little fancier though i love trader joe's just the clusters maple clusters amazing i've had that since i was a little kid because i was i grew up with the trader joe's around the around the corner from me so we always had that i still i had that a couple of days ago, chop up a banana in there. So good. Um, and then also a special case strawberry was something that I started to eat a lot in undergrad. I had my friend, uh, my friend, Zach, who graduated from UCSB. Um, I would visit him. He always had that in his house. And so I would just, it just, I just started eating it. So yeah, really kind of have a little bit of a spectrum we have a we have like a mapley we have like a sugary and then we have like a fruity oh my gosh <laughs> you like you just pulled a hannah i do that every episode <laughs> yeah. i could never like pick a firm answer and so i always like dabble in this dabble mm-hmm. in that um <laughs> special k i always think of like not to make fun of your choice i think it's a great no, please, choice please but do. i always think of like 1990s like diet culture like yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. my first thought with yeah. like special K, but it's really good. But I think of like the commercials and like lose weight. Oh, hundred yeah. percent. Yeah, yeah. I'm not eating this to lose weight. I just like it. Yeah, it I know you're not. <laughs> it does taste pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Emily, I want you to go first so I can think of my answer. <laughs> <laughs> my answer is going to be cinnamon toast crunch mm. because oh, yeah. I grew up. I didn't actually didn't grow up. My parents. My parents, they don't, they don't, I don't think they listen to the podcast, so I can, <laughs> I can talk about that. <laughs> um, but they were kind of like, if it says sugar as one of the first two ingredients, I wasn't allowed to get it. Oh no. So I would like go to my friend's house and get really excited about their cereals <laughs> and cinnamon toast crunch was one of the best ones. Cause my argument is the milk is not gross after it's then mm-hmm. like a nice cinnamon, almost like mm. horchata type oh, deal yeah. going on. Oh yeah. So that way, not only is the cereal component good, but also the milk component is good as well. It's mm. not gross or anything like point. soggy going on. There. I just got an idea after you now, I mean, this is if you're 21 plus, but after you have a bowl of <laughs> cinnamon toast crunch, you just add a little bit of rum and you got a rum chata, rum chata. Right there. Ooh. Ooh, that's not a bad idea. Okay, I have like eight different thoughts and like different directions <laughs> when you guys are talking. So my ADHD, ADHD brain cannot handle this. Okay, I first want to say that it's going to sound like I'm lying. Like I was just basing it off your guys' answer, but Cinnamon Toast Crunch was my like original answer. Awesome. It's so good. Top tier cereal. It's so good. It's so good. Um, My second thought was I watch Good Mythical Morning. Do you guys know what that is? It's a YouTube channel. I've heard of that. They just like do like fun like food challenges and stuff, but they like a week or two ago did a challenge where they tested like which cereal lasts the longest in milk without getting soggy. Oh, and cinnamon interesting. Toast, cinnamon Toast Crunch was like one of the first to go. It was like, it got soggy so fast. Oh, really? <laughs> you have to eat it pretty quickly. Do you not experience oh. that? I feel like it gets soggy so fast. I guess not. Maybe I just don't think about it. I feel like you being the slow eater that you are <laughs> would like be the epitome of like soggy cereal. <laughs> Maybe I don't eat it. I also don't put a lot of milk in my cereal. Oh. Mm. So that probably affects it a lot. That's true. I guess you don't do a lot of milk in general with anything because your body doesn't like that. Um, I had a third thought, but it's gone. So anyway. I know. I have a very weird contribution to the conversation. (laughs) Uh, When I was a little kid, up through maybe, I don't really do this late anymore. I would purposefully let my cereal get soggy. And then I was, I was actually had anxiety about saying that on this podcast, but even before we started, <laughs> because I was like, oh, they're going to be like, who the hell is this guy? Oh, we're judging you on, for judging sure. Me. But like, and I know it's, it was weird. Yeah. That was some, and Maybe I think it might resonate with someone. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> someone I, I definitely there. will. I'll lose all my clients, but I'll get one, <laughs> one more. I'll get one back. Uh, yeah. That. Yeah. So just something we're just trying to, trying to be a person and be vulnerable on this podcast. And, <laughs> That's what um, we appreciate. We like that. Yeah, We appreciate your honesty and showing your true self. Do you still <laughs> do that? Yeah. No, 
Yes, he or does. I or, yes, at least he does. I, or at least I haven't recently. But What's you nice about the Trader Joe's... I... What's nice about the clusters <laughs> is the milk gets soup like with the with the cinnamon toast crunch. The clusters are clusters, so they don't they don't really get soggy very much, very much. And but he wishes they but did. The <laughs> milk, I, yeah, I did a tear runs across my eye. <laughs> but the milk gets super mapley and yeah. and delicious. So yeah, I, I see what you're talking about the milk. Yeah, um, I'm thinking of those TikToks. Have you guys seen those where? Uh, I don't know who the creator is, but they make cereal into ice cream flavors. And the first step is they like let oh, the wow. cereal get soggy in the milk. Oh. I can't watch them because it grosses me out to think about the cereal <laughs> getting soggy in the milk. So you saying that, I'm like, that is so <laughs> interesting. Like the first thing they do is let it get soggy and like they strain it and like put it in the ice cream machine and all that. But the first step is it's like let it get soggy in milk. So it like turns into like the milky flavor. And I can't even watch past that point because it just like grosses me out so much. <laughs> I feel like there has to be a way to create the same flavor in the milk without doing that. Well, they like no. eventually strain it and all of that. But like the first step is they like make the milk taste like the cereal by like letting it soak. <laughs> I guess that makes sense. It's almost like a, like all the nut beverages, like yeah. the same mm-hmm. concept just with cereal. Yeah. yeah. Which I guess is a good bonus bonus question. What is the best milk to put in cereal? Is it just like cow's milk? Or do you guys have another preference? I have a strong oh, opinion. Wow. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> Emily, what is I... it? <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh, we're going to go into now. I thought you for another one. No, let's I, do it right now. I think that any, this is, this is going to get me like, Hot this, people are going to unfollow me for this. So <laughs> if we're going to be vulnerable. Yeah. <laughs> I think anything that is not skim milk is disgusting. Wow. That is not that's skim a milk. hot take. That is not skim milk. I grew up on skim milk. All these uh, childhood things are just so brainwashed in my <laughs> brain. Who knows if any of it's actually true? It's just what I grew up on. But I think it's like 2%. Holt milk grosses me out so much. It's just, I don't know what it is. I think it's, it's probably so thicker. Yeah. I guess the comparison, like, yeah, if, especially if that's just what you're used to, having that much more fat to your palate is yeah. like, this is wrong. Like, I'm drinking half and half. Like, I imagine, <laughs> yeah. like, I imagine that's probably what more would it kind of taste like. I mean, like it's not far off. Yeah. Like, yeah. You know, that's so interesting. That's I actually was raised on skim too. So for a long while there, I could not do anything but skim. Now I can like do 2%. It's fine. But I always buy skim. That's like my milk that i go to the store and purchase yeah, yeah. huh usually i let's see usually by at least in my household we always bought skim and one or two percent i feel like to me i don't know if i can taste i mean we could do a milk take that's what that's what episode two will be we'll do a milk taste. <laughs> yeah um <laughs> uh, riveting content <laughs> yeah um I, I can't say I definitely I mean whole milk definitely tastes different way different um one or two percent I don't know if I can taste that much of a difference me myself I always buy one percent um just because I eat usually like a, a lot of my meals are very uh I usually like my lunch and my dinners I say dinners because there's multiple <laughs> um uh are pretty low in fat so I get my fats from other other times of the day and and it just helps my digestion while I train and stuff. But um, that's, a, that's a really, that opened my eyes to, to skim milk. I have an, a newfound respect. And it's cool how you mentioned that you're bringing back like the, the childhood programming and we're getting this kind of therapy question going on. This is awesome. I love, I love, I love stuff like that. It's so true. Like yeah. with my patients that I see, it's never about the actual like food itself. It's like the why yeah. behind the food choice. Right. Yeah every time that's why we have therapists on staff where I work (laughs) yeah 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 we could do I was trying to think of like how to make it fun if we did a like blind milk test Ooh, and you like those tiktoks like they did the soda yeah and they have Mm -hmm. it labeled but you don't know Emily when you come visit we're so doing that I'm gonna be in so much you will be bring your lactate (laughs) bring your lactate oh my gosh that's so funny (laughs) We'll get, we'll get the fair life, the lactose free. Cause they have like all the different levels. Okay. So you'll be mm-hmm. safe. Okay. Do they taste similar to, I think so. 
they have more protein, so I buy them, but I think they taste the exact same. We'll have to do a taste test of those too. <laughs> we'll get ready to get in fair life. Yeah. We'll spend like 80 bucks on milk at the grocery <laughs> store. <laughs> oh, okay, oh, anyway. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Turned into a fair life, a fair life uh, uh, commercial. <laughs> I mean, I like, they need to be paying me. I talk about them constantly. <laughs> okay, cool. So, Elias, we like to. At the end, at the end of the end of our episodes, we'd <laughs> end like end. to give you the floor to promote whatever you want, like social media links, websites, programs, personal Absolutely. links, whatever it is you want to share Absolutely. with our listeners. This is your time to shine. Absolutely. If they want to hear kind of more from you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, guys. Um, I'm, this is actually an exciting time. I'm currently working with um, one of my old dear friends, uh, Liam, back in San Francisco. He uh, does marketing and business consulting, so we're working together. And I have a lot of projects, include like a website and, and all these other things in the works right now. So they're not live. I do have my um, fitness Instagram, which I'm now finally able to, I just, so I, my program right now is two years. Year one is very, uh, like physiology intensive and hands-on year two is a lot more independent projects. So I'm actually able to incorporate my business into my credits. Um, so you can find me at coach Elias underscore CPT, uh, soon to be MS CSCS. Very excited for that. Um, but you can find me there and we can just have a conversation. I do free consultations and a lot of people are like, Um, they get really worked up about starting a program. And I like to just have conversations, even if I almost know or don't think that they're going to sign up, I still like to do free consultations with people just to see if I can provide a little bit of perspective and help, help them on their way. And, you know, who knows, maybe I, I, I need to eat, obviously, that's why I have a business, but I like to just help people in general. And that makes me feel very fulfilled. I'm a very emotional guy. And so it just makes me happy in general. Um, so yeah, if you, if you ever want to have a conversation, you can find me on there. I have a, a Google forms that you can fill out in my bio. Um, I'm now actually currently accepting, uh, new clients because my school time contribution has, I'm not as crazy about, or not crazy about, but school timing is not as high. And so I now have the time and energy to take on more clients. So that'll be going on for the next a uh, couple of months um, at least. And then going forward, just being able to maintain those clients. So yeah, if you're listening and this is around the time that we're posting, um, definitely should send me a message. Amazing. Yeah. We'll link all that below so you guys can find it. Do you know when you plan to like have your website like up and running and everything? Yeah, I'm thinking right now we're working to have most of these items live by August. So right now it's June 13th. So we're looking around, honestly, around my 25th birthday, kind of quarter life crisis pivot um, (laughs) right there. Um, (laughs) No, but it's good. Um, So yeah, probably by around the end of August, if not sooner though, I know we're, I know first we're going live and then adding a bunch of things to it. Um, But yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to overstep and put my foot in my mouth, but that sounds, those are about the good estimates right there. Well, that is amazing. And also hilarious because you're like our third guest in the past, like three weeks that has like launched something and your episode comes out exactly like when it launches. So that is just (laughs) awesome. So whether it's like right after before, whatever, no pressure, like do it at a certain time, but um, hopefully you guys can check that out shortly after this episode comes out. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you guys. Yes. Well, Elias, thank you so so much for coming on today. This is like a brand new topic for us and our listeners. So it'll be such a good one to share. I'm so happy. Uh, We appreciate it so much. Thank you again. And those of you listening, thank you guys for tuning in and we will see you next week. All right. Bye guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for tuning in on this episode of the Upbeat Dietitians with your host, Emily Krause and Hannah Thompson. We appreciate you all so much for continuing to support us. In order to support us and sustain the success of this podcast, please subscribe and leave a rating and review. If you'd like to provide us feedback for future episodes and guest stars, follow us on Instagram at The Upbeat Dietitians. Lastly, you can show us support by providing a monthly donation using the link at the end of our bio. Once again, thank you so much for listening today and stay tuned next Wednesday for a new episode. 
Until then, we hope you have a wonderful rest of your week.